This is a city with a simulated market for taxi rides. New potential passengers are created every minute, each with a strong desire to get to their destination as fast and cheaply as possible. Meanwhile, the drivers are trying to earn as much money as possible from the passengers. I built this city to help us understand who benefits from Uber's surge pricing and who is hurt by it. Surge pricing is a system where prices change based on supply and demand, jacking up the fares when there's an excess of passengers while lowering fares when there's an excess of drivers. This stands in contrast to how things used to work before Uber, when the fare rules were totally static, often printed on the cab itself. Passengers tend to like surge pricing about as much as they like getting hit by a car. They often feel taken advantage of when they get charged exorbitant prices. In a few places, it's actually gotten banned as a result. The simulation will show us the different effects surge pricing has on rich and poor passengers. In this paper, the authors surprisingly found that passengers of all income levels benefited while drivers became worse off. Could that really be right? To see if we can reproduce that finding, we'll simulate two identical cities where the only thing that differs is that one has surge pricing while the other doesn't. But we'll start by looking at just one city and explain the most crucial event in the simulation the passenger's decision to get or not to get an Uber. This is Ariana. She uses a two-step process to decide how to get to her destination. Step one is to check what options are available. One option is to walk, which is free but takes a very long time. There is also the bus, which costs two and a half dollars and will take her there in a little less time. Lastly, she can order an Uber for $12, which will get her there in just 24 minutes. Step two is to calculate which option has the lowest total cost when accounting for both the fare and the value over time. In this moment, Ariana thinks her time is worth $68 per hour. Dang. That value is calculated based on her hourly income and her time sensitivity value. 1.70 implies that she's in a hurry. Maybe she's heading to a meeting and couldn't stand being late. To calculate the total cost of the Uber, we take the fare plus the time to destination times Ariana's value of time, which gives us about $39. The other two options both pencil out to be more costly after accounting for the value of time. So Ariana is super pumped to get the Uber. In general, these are the three main factors that make an agent more likely to choose an Uber. And Ariana checked two out of three, so for her it was an easy choice. Our first simulation will have the following settings. It will run for five hours. The passenger spawn rate will start off at around 10 per hour and then briefly shoot up to 40 per hour at 9 o'clock. But the number of Uber drivers remains the same during the whole simulation at 6 drivers. So during the peak, there will be way more demand for Ubers than there are available cars. Hmm. The fare calculation is fixed at $6 to start the ride, plus $1.5 per kilometer. So no surge pricing for now. Let's run it and see what happens. To make it easier to see what's going on, I made all the passengers the size of dinosaurs. Oh, and there's an element of randomness in where and when an agent spawns, so that's why there's a difference between the predicted and actual spawn rate. In the first two hours, the majority of agents are choosing to get an Uber, though some agents still choose to get a substitute since Uber isn't always the best option. But what will they do when demand starts to go up? Here we see something new. This red symbol means that there are no Ubers available, so this passenger had no choice but to take a different mode of transport. Based on the yellow line, it looks like Uber could handle a maximum of around 10 or 12 passengers per hour. When demand went above that level, most passenger agents had to take a substitute. That's fine, but there is actually a hidden problem here. Not that everyone couldn't get a ride, but rather who couldn't get a ride. Let's look at an example by going back in time, 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 time. This is Evan. He stands out from other agents in one regard, in that he's extremely time sensitive, and his other options besides Uber are pretty slow. When he opened the app, his worst nightmare came true. No Ubers were available so he was forced to take the bus, even though he really needed the Uber. So Uber seems to have done a bad job at allocating rides to the agents most in need, at least in Evan's case. Perhaps surge pricing will be better for him, since even though he will have to pay more, he is more likely to be offered a ride at all. So in addition to the static pricing simulation, 
Now let's look at the same city with surge pricing enabled. And let's see if Evan can catch a ride there. This graph shows the average fare in dollars, so we can see if the surge pricing algorithm actually does what we expect. When demand is low, the algorithm sets the price at a lower level than the static price. That does enable a few agents who didn't get a ride in the static pricing regime to get one in the surge pricing regime. The graph on the right compares how much time the passenger agents have to wait before the Uber arrives to pick them up. I want to show you this graph because a common justification for surge pricing is that it reduces waiting times. When demand peaks around 9 o'clock, the surge fares go up drastically, while the static fares predictably remain around the same level as before. On the right side graph, we see that the waiting times in the static pricing regime became noticeably longer compared to the surge pricing regime. Overall, a big takeaway is that the effects of surge pricing are completely different depending on if we look at a period of excess demand or excess supply. Let's first look at how passengers are affected during periods of excess demand, when prices become very high. First of all, why did surge pricing cause waiting times to be shorter? Well, waiting times will be longer on average when fewer drivers are available. When there are zero idle drivers, you might still be able to get a ride, since drivers can queue up their next passenger before they drop off their current one, but waiting times will be terrible. The point is that with static pricing, there were usually zero idle drivers during times of high demand, while with surge pricing, there were around one or two. That's why static pricing had longer waiting times. Some passengers are happy to wait a little extra if it helps them save money, but this adds waste to the system. With a higher fare, the driver earns more money, but longer waiting times doesn't help anyone. Certainly, it doesn't help the driver pay his bills. But if we run the simulation with constant high demand, we see that the reduced waiting times might not be entirely a good thing. Because what does it imply that more drivers are available? That they are spending more time waiting around, not transporting passengers? In fact, during times of high demand, surge pricing will give rides to 19% fewer passengers on average. But how much do these things actually matter for the individual passenger? We can quantify the effects in terms of dollars. First of all, the average fare during this period of high demand went up from $17 with static pricing to $40 with surge pricing. That's a $23 loss for each passenger. Average waiting time was reduced from 18 minutes to 11 minutes, a gain which the passengers valued at $8 per ride. But we served 19% fewer passengers. Those agents lost out on the benefits of Uber, and if we spread out that loss across all passengers, we get an average of $5 lost. So surge pricing is not doing well by passengers so far. But what about the effects of allocation? Let's check if Evan managed to get an Uber in the surge pricing simulation. Yes! Great, but one example doesn't tell us that much, especially since I handpicked Evan to prove my point. What we want to know is whether surge pricing will allocate more rides to time-sensitive passengers like Evan in general. Before we find out, it'll be helpful to show how the time-sensitivity trait is distributed among the agents. If we take everyone from the simulation and put them on a graph sorted by time-sensitivity, we get a nice distribution centered around one, with a few outliers such as Evan there on the right. Will surge pricing allocate more rides to the people on the right tail of the distribution? Or will it instead allocate more rides to agents with higher income? This distribution is more unequal, so maybe it will have a bigger impact on the passengers' decisions. To get results we can trust, we'll need bigger sample size. So it's time to massively scale up the simulation to 40 pairs of cities, all simulating a period of peak demand. You can send your best wishes to my graphics card. In this graph, we're looking specifically at the top 10% most time-sensitive passenger agents, so basically people like Evan. What percentage of people from this group got an Uber? Okay, the number who got rides was 18 percentage points higher with surge pricing. Cool, but as many of you will have predicted, income level also became more important than in the static price simulation. The percentage who got rides among the most high-earning passengers increased by 9 percentage points. This is not a paradox, both factors became more important at the expense of the random luck factor, which dictated who got a ride in the static price simulation. So since the agents who got a ride in the surge pricing version were more time sensitive on average, they valued the time they saved thanks to Uber at $8 more per ride than the passengers in the static pricing version. The surge passengers also had slower potential substitutes. This meant that Uber saved them an extra 3 minutes of time on average, adding $4 of welfare. But in total, during times of high demand, surge pricing made the average passenger worse off by $2.48, with low-income passengers getting hurt disproportionately, while high-income earners actually made a small gain. Again, these are the effects during high demand. If we look at data from a period of low demand, when surge pricing causes lower fares, the results completely flip, and poor passengers become the biggest winners. 
So to fairly answer the question of which groups of agents benefit and which are hurt by surge pricing, we should again look at the previous scenario, which included both periods of low demand and a short period of high demand, but now scale up to 40 pairs of cities. The graph is measuring total welfare gain for all passengers, split into four groups based on their income. On the right side graph, we're looking at the gross profit generated for the drivers and for Uber itself. During the time of low demand in the beginning, surge pricing benefited all groups of passengers while it made drivers poorer. That makes sense since surge pricing decreased the fares during this period. Then demand increases, pushing prices up, which is more favorable for drivers. When all is said and done, passengers and drivers, as well as Uber itself, have all made small gains. In this scenario, the average surge fares were slightly higher than the static fares, which is why drivers and Uber increased their profit. If we add up the effects on all market participants, this is the final result, an 8% gain in total welfare. So most of the agents are celebrating, but at the individual level, they were both winners and losers. Even when a change in the economy increases overall welfare, it's inevitable that some people lose out. Someone had to get priced out of the market to make space for people like Evan. Of course, an economic simulation is only as good as the assumptions that it's built upon. I'll leave it up to the viewer to decide if this model is realistic enough to tell us anything about the real economy. Hey there! Creating this video was a big undertaking. Building the software and creating all the bugs and then fixing them, it just took so much time. If you want to see more videos like this, more simulation-based videos, you should show your support by clicking the subscribe button and like the video.